ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We will be starting in a few minutes. Thank you. Lots of practice in the classroom, as you can see. Good evening, everyone. It's a real pleasure to welcome you here to the University of Bristol. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Professor Evelyn Welsh. I'm the Vice Chancellor and President of the University. This is the 11th annual State of the City address, and COVID pandemic aside, we've had the honor of hosting them all here in the Great Hall. And this is indeed my second uh, time to introduce this address. Tonight's event will focus on how Bristol can meet the challenges of the future, and it's a timely theme. While Bristol is a dynamic city, that boasts the highest employment rates amongst the major cities in the UK, alongside its many considerable strengths, there also exist deep-seated structural factors which continue to create obstacles for too many people. There are persistent challenges around deprivation, health inequalities, housing affordability, transport and environmental concerns such as air pollution, and the need for sustainable urban planning to combat climate change, to name only a few. And there's been real progress in addressing many of these areas over recent years.
Thank you. Let's start all over, shall we? <laughs> So Bristol has a long and proud tradition of disruptive protest. <laughs> and not just protesting, what I've been very impressed by um, Mayor Marvin Rees's points that he's made consistently throughout his term is it's not enough to wear a t-shirt. It's not enough to have a banner. You actually need to make the interventions that make people's lives better. And <laughs> And so even in the one year that I've been in office as the first female vice president, president here of the University of Bristol, I have seen real progress in this city, real conversations that made a real difference to the people on the ground. And as we approach the transition to a new committee system of governance at City Hall next year, tonight's panel provides an opportunity to take stock to come together in thinking about what comes next, not just after the past decade, but over the past 650 years since we became a city, and how we build on previous successes. And I'd like to take this opportunity to personally, and on behalf of the institution, pay tribute to Mayor Marvin Rees for everything he's done for all of Bristol since his election in 2016. Marvin has been an exceptional ambassador for the city on the international stage as well as the national stage. And the number of people who come over from the US to join us is testimony to that. He's a leader who helped Bristol move through some of its most difficult periods from the COVID pandemic to the toppling of the Colston statue. He has been a key voice in advocating for the vital role cities can and will play to address many global city issues. I particularly want to commend his leadership on Bristol One City, a significant initiative which brings together a wide range of public, private and third sector parties working together to identify solutions to some of our most pressing challenges. And at the university, we've been engaged with the One City approach from its inception, working closely with Bristol City Council and indeed cities around the world to help better understand the complex challenges we all face. And as a university committed to its founding civic mission, we're intensifying our focus on finding these solutions to local, national and global challenges. And at the heart of our approach is a firm belief that we can achieve so much more when we work together with others. And that's why, in addition to One City, I was proud earlier this year to have signed a landmark new civic university agreement in partnership with the University of the West of England, City of Bristol College, Bristol City Council and the City Office. We absolutely want to be the university for Bristol as well as the University of Bristol. And we will work together to boost the local economy, enhance skills, create employment, promote equality, diversity and inclusion, support health and well-being, and help address and enhance the sustainability of our whole city. Now, I'm very much looking forward to hearing what the mayor and our panel have to say on these issues shortly. But for now, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Bristol's fourth city poet, Cat Lyons, back to the stage. Cat is a writer, performer, and workshop facilitator working in the field of spoken word poetry and performance storytelling. Their poetry has been fe featured in Under the Radar, Ink, Sweat and Tears, and Bath Mag, and their debut poetry collection, Love Beneath the Nails, was published by Verve Poetry Press. This is Kat's second year in the role, and a new poem has been commissioned for the occasion. Welcome again to the University of Bristol, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of the evening. I'm sorry I can't promise you more protests throughout. Cat. It's a total honor to, to be here um, again less intimidating than it was last year. I'm used to the space now and all the friendly faces in it. Um, so, has anyone here heard of John Keats? Oh, I got, yeah, a few people, yeah. 
Um, as, that's not going to be a test, it's fine. Um, anyone heard of his poem, To Autumn? Some of you have. For those of you that haven't, you might have heard bits of it. It's the one that goes, season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, close bosom friend of the maturing sun, conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit that round the thatch eaves run. And the rest of the poem continues in this vein, and it uses this flowery, very romantic language um, of a pastoral ideal to explore the seasons and the inherent mutability of life. And when I had this commission and I was beginning to write my poem, uh, I decided I wanted to borrow this language and transpose it into the urban landscape in which we live today in Bristol and use it to explore Bristol as a city that is constantly shifting its capacity to encompass change and to endure hardship and to withdraw into itself when, um, when necessary before springing out again, renewed later. I think autumn is a perfect time to think about resilience. Everyone everywhere, the flowers and the fruits are fading and dropping and the leaves are starting to change colour and the nights are drawing in, it's getting cold, we're wearing jumpers, it's raining, if summer feels a long way away and we just have to keep on holding on in the knowledge that it, it will come back because the world can be quite a hard place sometimes um, but we keep on keeping on. People have been living here in this city for over 650 years, doing their best to shape it into something beautiful and livable for them and their families and their families' families. And out of rot, we have to hold on to the fact that there always comes renewal. And in another 650 years, who knows what shape this place will be in. Um, so in these turbulent and difficult times, I wanted to give you an autumn poem that honours the resilient spirit of our city and all the people who live in it, which includes all of you here in this room today. And it's called To Bristol in Autumn, after John Keats. If the year was our digestive biscuit, We'd only have a mouthful left, barely enough to dunk. We're down to crumbs. And frankly, this season has been cooked too long. Now change hums loud as bees. Wasps argue in your alley, drunk on rot. And last year's crop of students spread their leaves and watch the seedlings sway. Yes, you can be beautiful. We've all watched the silvered mists festoon your bridges, Sunday walked beneath crisp skies studded with balloons. But this is no pastoral, and these days we bring the bins in, not the sheaves. Even your squirrels look stressed and clutch their nuts protectively. And it's hard to feel mellow when so many harvests are so lean. But we are gleaners, plucking treasure from the winnowed husks of shops. We find fruitfulness in decay, kindle sparks behind locked shutters and light up your streets again. Winter is a stranger sitting too close on the train. Rent and fuel bills creep, but we hold tight to possibilities to the spring inside the soil, to the friend we don't yet know. We don't stand still. We stream through brand new stations, eddy around closed bridges, map the flow of our migrations, how the marks of our desire lines shift and fade. Your pavements are grazed by flocks of scooters now. Your soundtrack scored by the rattle as we race them up your hills, Bristol, do you remember horse-drawn carriages? Your roads unpaved, unlit? You're still maturing. 650 years old, you're not exactly young, but you carry your centuries lightly. You've grown stylish as you've aged. 
And today you wear the sun low and casual, tugged across your greying sky. Sit down. Let's talk about nothing very important. Let's watch the gulls conspiring with the pigeons to steal crisps. Let's make a list of all the tiny movements in your symphony. As days sigh with relief and sink into your harbour, let's speak of legacy, of how a black child living in a city built by slavers learns to see himself reflected in the face of his elected mayor. How he slips on that knowledge each morning with his school shoes and walks it into his future. We mulch our present, use it to fertilise our tomorrows. And despite the rutted tarmac, the withered bus routes, the loads too heavy to lift sometimes, we're still here. And whether blitzed or burnt or battered by inflation, we determined pips shelter in your core and wait for the weather to turn. Sometimes we step up, break new ground, then step away. Sometimes we lie fallow, bless the quiet earth, whispering promises as we unspool. We dug ourselves from lockdown's rubble, Filled our hearts, echoing vaults with golden hour chat with pixelated friends, our families origamied into screens. But chaos scatters unknown fruit. Some fires leave us standing amid shoots of unexpected green. Planted in our gardens of solitude, the chat groups flourished reached tendrils through concrete into silent flats, carried our neighbours' voices on their laden vines. Your streets are still entwined. Our conversations glow like fireflies in our cupped hands. We know that no harvest is certain. We know the year will call last orders soon that soon we'll have to stretch, prepare for action for another waltz around the sun, but don't clear our plates just yet. Let's taste this windfall moment. Listen to life ricochet from rented bedroom windows, scratch with sparrows in the eaves, drip from broken gutters. Fill us with your music, Bristol. Give us space to come undone. Then wind our clockwork up again, set us on your streets and watch us run. Thank you so much. And now, thank you. And now it's my very great pleasure to introduce your youth mayor, Maya Parker, to the stage. Good evening. My name is Maya and I am the Youth Mayor of Bristol. I am 18 years old, currently studying Psychology, Sociology and English Literature at Bristol Cathedral Choir Sixth Form. I'd first like to express how immensely grateful I am to be speaking here. It is so valuable to have the voices of Bristol's young people being represented at this scale. So thank you to Mayor Marvin Rees for inviting me to speak today. I was elected as Youth Mayor by my fellow members of the Youth Council. We're made up of 35 young people, with 24 elected by over 11,000 young people across Bristol, along with five co-optees from our equalities groups and six area representatives. We collaboratively aim to fairly represent the voices of our city's young people. In half of our fortnightly meetings, we work in campaign groups with the goal of making Bristol an inclusive, safe, and healthy city for all of its young people. The rest of our meetings are formal meetings in which we invite guests to speak to us. Please don't hesitate to offer any support you may have for our campaign groups or to ask for a slot in one of our formal meetings if you feel it could be helpful for either yourself or for us. As Youth Mayor, I co-chair the One City Children and Young People's Board with Deputy Mayor Asha Craig. 
I sit on the Transport Board as a representative of the Youth Council. These are incredible opportunities personally, allowing me to develop skills and participate in conversations and actions revolving around topics that I'm really passionate about. More importantly, a space for young people has been created. Our voice is a part of these conversations. I love Bristol, and I'm so grateful to have grown up in such a beautiful, diverse, culturally rich city. Bristol Pride has been a highlight of my year, a chance to see members of my community come together and celebrate queer joy. But Pride is first and foremost a protest, and we still have some ways to go. It can be easy to adopt a Lemonas attitude towards marginalized groups, but I urge you to empathize and to care. In response to the recent increase in transphobia from political figures across the country, a close friend of mine who is one of Bristol's young people made a piece of art with the caption, please let me grow up. We must ensure that all young people feel and are welcome and safe in our city. Young people's mental health is a huge issue currently. Mental health provisions being made available for young people before they reach crisis point needs to be prioritized. Further still, Bristol needs to be an environment which fosters positive mental health to begin with. If you were to ask any young person in this city about environments they'd like to see, there's a very good chance that the transport would be brought up. Free, accessible transport for 16 to 25 year olds will allow us to access education and employment. Earlier this year, the Youth Council hosted a debate on school exclusions and how these disproportionately impact upon the access to education of some groups of young people, including black young people and young people with special, special educational needs and disabilities. We naturally came to the conclusion that this issue needs to be tackled. During my five years on the Youth Council, the climate crisis has fairly consistently come up as an issue that the young people of Bristol really care about. And we've demonstrated this quite clearly through the Youth Strikes for Climate. Young people have also been present at the toppling of the Colson statue and marches in solidarity with the people of Palestine. We are passionate, we have opinions and ideas. We can criticize today's worlds from a different perspective and offer nuanced ideas for tomorrow's. And all that we ask is that you listen. My time on the Youth Council is drawing to a close, but I can't wait to see what the next brilliant group of young people will achieve. It is imperative that as Bristol moves to a committee system, the Youth Council maintains its positive relationship with the rest of the Council. The actions we take today directly shape the future of Bristol, and that is our future. Thank you. In 10 years time, thanks to the work we're doing now, together, Bristol is a city of hope where everyone shares in our city's success. Next door to the Bottle Yard Studios, our Hollywood in Hengrove, families have moved into the new homes built by Gorham Homes. South Bristol's world-class youth zone serves thousands of young people, inspiring further sites across our city. More thriving businesses alongside new homes and community space have rejuvenated Philwood Broadway. New transport options have changed life in our city, with mass transit on the way. Castle Park is a green oasis among many new homes and businesses. Even more life has been breathed into our city centre with more than £2 billion of planned development delivered in town. Our waterways are clean and crisscrossed by restored and new bridges. Historic buildings sit alongside a new school, homes and campus at Temple Quarter and Bristol Beacon shines at the heart of our cultural offer that's accessible from every corner of our city. Nature is in recovery across Bristol, thanks in part to a growing tree canopy and green space for all Bristolians. <coughs> Heading northwest, a flurry of new train stations connect even more parts of our city. YTL Arena Bristol is one of the country's largest and greenest, attracting global events. Bristol Zoo Project is thriving at a site ten times larger than the old Clifton one, which is now public gardens on the doorstep of new affordable homes. Our city's infrastructure stands strong after historic investment, from the Iron Bridge to even more community wind turbines, while our world-first Bristol City LEAP partnership powers a sustainable, inclusive and resilient city. 
Together, we have built a better Bristol, a living wage city, a city of sanctuary, our city of hope. Thank you uh, very much. And that really much is setting out what we could become, the future, if we describe it um, and then work together uh, to make it happen. Um, I, this is my eighth and final State of the City. Uh, I was going to say at the beginning that it is not unlikely that we'll be interrupted by protesters. And obviously Evelyn beat me to it. <laughs> because it is the final and it's a high profile event, so don't be surprised. Before I do continue, I just want to thank um, uh, Maya, um, Kat and, and Evelyn uh, for the introduction as well. Absolutely amazing. Um, we, one is Evelyn has been an amazing city partner. As I said, we can't get stuff done in Bristol unless we all align. The University of Bristol, I think, has really uh, stepped up. Um, I want to say of, of Kat, in terms of our city poet, uh, the way I described it when we launched it, the very first Miles Chambers City Poet was, journalists should capture the facts, hmm? and, uh, <laughs> and the City Poet should capture the soul um, of the city. And, and I think we certainly heard that today. And in Maya, you, you see an example of why we have our youth mayors. The issues she put on the table are issues of real substance. And they're not just immediate gratification issues. These are long-term, uh, they are about transport, um, housing, investing in mental health, all those things that build for a strong, resilient society, uh, the one that we're gonna, we are going to need if we're going to survive the challenges that, and hold ourselves together uh, in the world that's coming um, our way. I want to say uh, thank you to you all for being here uh, tonight. Thank you to University for this amazing uh, venue as well every year. Uh, thank you to Andrew Kelly and the team who have worked so hard to put this event on um, all those years and uh, tonight um, as well. A thank you to you all as well for being here and I want to extend that thank you to everyone who's taken time out of their busy lives over the years you know I've been in there and before me with uh, George uh, to attend our previous addresses. And I do also want to say that we have some very special guests here this evening. We have the President of the US Conference of Mayors, the Mayor of Reno, Nevada, Hillary Sheaves. So thank you for being with us uh, today. And two for one, <laughs> we have Tom Cochran, who's the Chief Executive of the US Conference of Mayors. He's with us as well uh, this evening. And another mention, uh, we have representatives from the US Embassy, including Rebecca Lewis, and it just goes to say, uh, it just goes to show that Bristol, this little city here, oh, there you go, clap for Rebecca, <laughs> and the embassy, you know, just, just, just how present we have been and the contribution and the quality of relationships uh, uh, we've built um, over the years. And, that, and again, I say that's not just about me, that's about the way the city has operated, uh, both nationally and internationally. Uh, and just want to say thank you uh, for being with us and we really look forward to strengthening the relationships between Bristol and US cities uh, in the years ahead. And I have a personal interest in that too. My wife is American and my kids are dual nationality as well. So uh, maybe get some hosting when we go over there. Uh, wouldn't mind some of them free tours. <laughs> so let, uh, this evening um, I want to cover uh, three key areas. Um, I want to set out what I call uh, a continue to-do list for Bristol, and it covers the fundamentals. Housing, mass transit, climate change, and regeneration. And I'll touch on the scale of the opportunities and the challenges that each present to us. Second, I want to share some of the insights we've gained uh, from our time uh, leading Bristol. And I'm gonna talk particularly about two uh, insights. That's one about interdependence, and another about the nature of power. And thirdly, I'm going to offer some challenges and some opportunities to the future leaders of our city and our city region. But before I step into that, I just want to give you a little bit of an overview of my time in office. So I was elected in 2016 and we came with big ambitions for Bristol. But we came with a specific kind of ambition, one that was grounded in a commitment to inclusion and making Bristol a city in which everyone can have hope. We came in with a commitment to build homes, 
to tackle hunger and to unlock social mobility. And of course, we want to pursue carbon neutrality. Now, it's not straightforward. We've faced some serious challenges. We've had significant political upheaval. The UK voted to Brexit a month and a half after I was elected. Since 2016, we've had five prime ministers and eight ministers for local government. We've had heightened awareness of the climate and ecological emergencies, and we've experienced extreme weather events. We face the prospect of national leaders failing to deliver the scale of change at the pace that's needed if we're to award, uh, avoid the worst possible outcomes of climate change. We've had a global pandemic, lockdown and wars. We've simultaneously had the cost of living crisis and what we call the cost of operating crisis. We've held the city together through the, co the toppling of the Colston statue and the counter rallies that followed. We've grappled with the government's austerity programme, which disproportionately cut the budgets of local authorities. We face growing demand for our services and the growing cost of providing those services, particularly around adults, care and children. Something that's led to several local councils around the country effectively filing for bankruptcy. And we inherited a city, as Evelyn pointed out, in which uh, which has entrenched inequalities. We've inherited a city in which infrastructure is at the end of its life. The chocolate path, the sluice gates, the harbour walls, bridges and up and down the River Avon and the cut, including the main St Anne's Road Bridge, the M32 viaduct and St Philip's Causeway. And I said that sits alongside our entrenched race and class inequalities in Bristol that map so seamlessly onto the city's geography. But Throughout, we have retained our focus on delivery and working with our city partners for positive change. We've delivered 12,534 homes. Last year, we saw the opening of 106 welcoming spaces to support people in Bristol facing financial challenges during the coldest months. We've had the Strive Internship Programme, which supported minoritized students getting access to careers in the professional services. We secured a hundred million pounds investment for Temple Meads and Temple Quarter. We signed the one billion pound City Leap Energy Investment Bill. Uh, the level of delivery that we have overseen in Bristol has led to us being invited to take positions of national and international leadership. In the UK, I was invited to chair Core Cities UK and the LGA City Regions Board. I co-chaired the UK Urban Futures Commission reports on the future of the UK cities and represented Bristol on the advisory board of 3CI. Internationally, we've been asked to participate in COP. I sit on the Mayor's Migration Council. I sit on the UN SDG Urban Finance Commission and we were invited onto the Bloomberg Harvard City Leadership uh, Initiative. We've played a key role in placing cities at the centre of action on climate change and migration. And no one does it alone. So I want to spend some time saying thank you to just some of those who have come together to work so hard to deliver for Bristol. And this includes people like Andy Street and Ed Robry, who time and time again deliver for Bristol. And I don't know how you really fit it all in. It includes our city partners and the city office, including Andrea Dell, who until just recently held that whole city partnership uh, together, the one that Evelyn mentioned at the beginning. We have people like Sado Jurde, Paul Hassan, Sandra Meadows, Marty Burgess, who have been constant sources of delivery-focused positivity in Bristol. We have James Creed, everyone at Empire Fighting Chance, Amari Cato and Saeed Ismaili, who work almost invisibly with young people across our city region. Some of those young people at high risk uh, of, of falling into destructive uh, lifestyles. Now, in line with that, every year I announce our latest recruits to become international ambassadors. And they will tonight join uh, the existing ambassadors who use their profile and international connections to increase Bristol's international presence. So I'll share the names with you tonight and I'm going to ask you to stand up. We have Muna Abdi, who personifies... Muna.
Muna is just a phenomenal human being. Uh, she personifies entrepreneurial spirit and the positive impact that refugee and migrant businesses can have in Bristol. We have Dr. Razvan Kontanchinescu, MBE, who fa there we go. And Raz, uh, Razvan uh, founded From Bristol With Love to deliver humanitarian aid to children with special needs in Romania and aid to Ukrainian refugees. And I don't think he's with us tonight, but we have Professor Leon Tickley of the University of Bristol. And I worked with Leon on a project on social mobility God, over 10 years ago now, top man. And he is the UNESCO Chair in Inclusive Good Quality Education and the Global Chair in Education at the University of Bristol. So before you get busy, I want to say thank you now. <laughs> I also want to thank uh, the Labour group in Bristol, uh, the councillors uh, in my own party who have worked so hard uh, you know, and backed uh, delivery in Bristol. And I also need to thank the councillors who have served in my cabinet um, over the years. Uh, and this is always difficult, but I'm just going to pick out Asher and Craig the, as deputy mayors as well. Um, I, obviously, I have... Um, Nicola and Ellie here as well. We have uh, Helen, Kai, I'm always going to meet Tom. <laughs> I feel like I need to mention everyone now. <laughs> because I don't know. Who? Don. <laughs> yeah. And actually, I will also mention the, the, when we did first start, we did have a cross party cabinet. Um, and I, I will also say thank you to those who served uh, in that initial cross party cabinet as well. Um, but I do need to thank um, all of you and, and my deputy mayors. Um, I don't think that people, well, you have to be in politics or be close to it to realise just how much goes into it. Um, I remember coming, actually another cabinet member was in, Helen Godwin, and coming out at her desk and seeing her working over policy papers, but also in tears at the same time as she's looking at and understanding the situations that some of our children are facing. That is compassionate, empathetic, engaged political leadership. We don't always see that that is often the reality of what happens behind the headlines, behind the interviews and behind uh, closed doors, trying to make decisions uh, for Bristol. And of course, I also need, want, have to thank my family, my wife, uh, Kirsten, my children, my mum, my brothers and sisters, uh, and my extended family uh, as well, for always supporting me, uh, for putting up with me, being the mayor, uh, for being away from home and all the other things that bring uh, stress and, and additional pressure to their lives. And I'm, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> some, some of my trolls have sometimes says, don't worry, you're gonna have a lot more time on your hands soon. I don't think they realize my wife's not too unhappy about that. <laughs> uh, and I also just, just particularly tonight. I, I also want to extend some thanks to my brother Martin, who's no longer with us, uh, having taken his life uh, just a few years ago. And just for the record, I'll just say I'll always be proud of him. Mm. Mm. I always struggle to get through that. <laughs> so let's look now at Bristol and our cities continue to do list. So I start with homes um, and Bristol must continue to do homes. Housing captures so many of Bristol's contradictions and complexities. We have 42 square miles. We are 472,000 people. We have 20,000 people on the housing waiting list, 1,300 households in temporary accommodation and we anticipate our population reaching 550,000 by 2050. Just, 80, well, I'll get my math wrong, 27 years away. So we have to build homes faster than we have for decades just to stand still. Schroeder's recent report demonstrates the current cost of a house in the UK is nine times the average earnings. The last time houses were this expensive by ratio was 150 years ago. By comparison, just 40 years ago, house prices were four times the average earnings. As a result, home ownership has fallen, the private rental sector is back to levels not seen since the early 1980s, 
And all this is spilling over into gentrification, leaving thousands in our city struggling just to keep a toehold in their city. We must deliver homes, but we must do so in the context of the climate and ecological emergencies. The competition between homes, nature, leisure, transport, employment, food growing for our 42 square miles is real. Every home that is not built on brownfield land will increase pressure on these other priorities, including the need to protect land for nature. So we must build to maximise efficiency, recycling previously used brownfield land rather than greenfield land and prioritising active travel. But there are some challenges. Since 2016, 12,543 homes have been built. The government say we need around 50,000 new homes built by 2040. There are opportunities in the pipeline that must be completed, including Temple Quarter, which can provide over 10,000 homes, the Debenham site, 520 homes, the galleries, 450 homes, and student living for 800. Olympian plans for Avon House, 574 homes, of which 442 for students. Western Harbour, up to 3,000 homes with 50% affordable. Hengrove Park, 1,435, including 50% social and affordable homes. Froome Gateway, 1,000 homes. Baltic Wharf, 150 homes. The Fruit Market will deliver 500 homes. That's 26,000 more units in the pipeline, all coming forward for development with £2 billion of investment. These are some of the challenges that are in place to deliver in this. First, work needs to continue to turn Bristol City Council into a housing delivery organisation. That goes both for the officers and for the political, the politicians in the organisation. Investment from national government is going to be critical to this challenge. We set up our own Gorham Homes, a council-homed um, housing company. This strengthens our ability to build work uh, with the public and private investors to build council homes. Gorham is currently building the 1,400 homes in Hengrove. And I thank the Chief Executive, Stephen Baker, and his team for the way they have reshaped the company to deliver. Second, the council must deliver where it can, but it is a decreasingly small part of the story. Partnership is needed, both with government agencies, but critically with the private sector. We cannot deliver the numbers of homes needed without private developers and investors. So we must ensure Bristol remains open for business and continues to work with developers to maximise the likelihood of us getting the kind of homes we need, dense, centrally located, affordable and efficient. Third, this work has to be led. We must do Bristol on purpose. Politicians cannot be passive spectators in the development of the city. Developers must know what we're about and we must work with them to ensure their schemes match our ambition. We've been clear that we want people who can help us deliver the UN Sustainable Development Goals. If they can, they're more likely to win support in the planning process. We don't believe in leaving our city's future to markets and quasi-judicial processes. It's our job to make sure these processes work for the ends we want. And remember, uncertainty is a deterrent to the public and private sector investors we need. There is a nervousness among developers resulting not only from the rising costs of a crashed economy, but also a complete change in the leadership structure as Bristol leaves the Merrill model behind. The next leadership will need to bring developers and investors to the city and ensure confidence in our commitment to delivering homes. We must continue to do climate and ecology. Now, one of the most frustrating and dangerously naive challenges to me on climate change is all it takes is political will. The truth is it takes political will and billions of pounds. When you secure the money, slogans become delivery, and that's what counts, delivery. Our administration has invested over £100 million in decarbonisation work since 2016. Our City Leap deals means that over the next five years, £630 million will be invested to cut energy bills, create green jobs, slash carbon emissions by over 150,000 tonnes. 
We've planted over 90,000 trees since 2015 and contributed to a deal with Ambition Lance Western, which erected the tallest onshore wind turbine in England. All this will contribute to our city goal of becoming carbon neutral by 2030, an incredibly challenging aspiration. It's why we've been so active nationally and internationally on the issues of cities and finance. It was the central theme of my TED talk, and it's why we have been so invested in developing 3CI, the Cities Commission for Climate Investment. This is a partnership between UK Cities Catapult, Core Cities UK, key cities and local authorities across the UK. Together, we have identified a £300 billion pipeline of decarbonisation investment opportunities across the UK cities and are facilitating an unprecedented public and private sector partnership to secure that money. Unlocking the investment needed to decarbonise our cities will be central to the message I take to this year's COP. It's also important to understand a city goal is a city goal and cannot be delivered by the council alone. We need the innovation, capacity, resources of all city institutions. It's why our One City Climate Strategy is a One City Climate Strategy rather than just a Bristol City Council strategy. We're challenged by the fact that over a decade of national government austerity has hollowed out local government expertise and capacity needed to drive climate work. And it's why we're working with the SDG Finance Committee on a restructuring of global finance to get money into the hands of cities. And I'll finish on climate with this point on homes. Building the right homes in the right locations will be one of the biggest determinants of our future climate impact. It was the World Health Organization that said, after world peace, urban planning is the world's most important issue. We have to build Bristol in the right way. We must continue to do transport. Now I'm gonna focus on the public debate we're having right now in Bristol and the region about mass transit. The absence of a mass transit system is one of the city region's biggest challenges. We must go beyond make do and mend. This is a moment when we can make a decision that shapes the city for a century and more. Now let me suggest the characteristics of a mass transit scheme must be these. It must move hundreds of thousands of people every day. It must be segregated to guarantee reliability. It must serve areas of the highest density. It must connect disconnected communities to each other and to jobs. And it must deliver modal shift. I think if we agree this criteria, the system actually begins to design itself. The mass transit system has to include elements of underground in the densest areas. Now, the geological work has actually been done. The economic case is well underway, and we are ready to progress to the business case. The reports that have been done on this work suggest that the overground option could actually be hugely expensive due to the catastrophic impact on the highways network the moving of utilities and future legal wrangling over compulsory purchase orders on land and buildings. They actually show that an underground cannot be, an overground cannot be delivered without the permanent closure of major roads, including Gloucester Road, Church Road and St Luke's Road. When this is taken into account, the overground becomes undeliverable. Now to hear some of the opposition voices who say underground is pie in the sky, you wouldn't think that London went underground in 1863, 160 years ago. And I would say this, I understand that Bristol has failed to deliver big for so many years and people have become cynical and skeptical, but let's not allow old failures to rob us of the ability to recognize huge opportunities when they're right in front of us. I also urge us to avoid the false trade-offs between meeting today's challenges and planning a system for future populations. We must do both at the same time. We'd be in a very different position to the one we're in today if previous iterations of political leadership had worked with 20-year transport plans. Now we're close to having the alignment we need. Business back taking forward underground. Our combined authority officers back taking forward the underground options. Bristol City Council officers back taking forward the underground options and the leaders of South Gloucestershire and Bath North East Somerset back taking forward the underground options for further investigation. 
And this morning, the National Infrastructure Commission recommended £22 billion of investment in mass transit systems for Manchester, Birmingham, Bristol and... Well, Bristol was supposed to be my last one. Leeds and Bristol. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, I, I, kind of, I kind of killed my old drum roll there, didn't I? <laughs> so the opportunity is there. But we need to step forward to take it. And I'm going to quote Barack Obama here. Change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Mm. Next on my list, we must continue to do regeneration. Temple Quarter is one of the biggest and most exciting regeneration projects in Europe. Over 10,000 homes in a sustainable location, 22,000 jobs, 1.5 billion pound annually to the economy. It protects nature by concentrating development on brownfield land, restores the waterway along the Avon, and will strengthen our resilient resilience by investing in flood defence. It's an investment in our society, bringing families back to the city centre as part of balanced communities. Moreover, we have anchored the UN Sustainable Development Goals into the scheme. We've put them at the centre of the project. And Temple Quarter is an example of how Bristol will need to work together to deliver. First, we agreed what we needed to get done. All the landowners, Bristol City Council, Homes England, Network Rail, University of Bristol, and key partners agreed on the opportunity and the need to regenerate Temple Quarter. And we committed to working together. Second, with that agreement, we presented a united front to government. We first met as long ago as 2017 and made government aware of our ambitions. We actually invited them to be part of our working group and work through the land assembly, map out and secure the investment required and get the permissions in place to put a deal together. After all that work, we were ready when the government and the private sector were ready. Third, we have built a collaborative structure and a culture that is being turned into a joint delivery vehicle, a vehicle that will oversee this 15 year build out for this part of Bristol. And this is gonna enable us to overcome small bureaucracy and the small politics and empower communities and partners to really deliver for our city. Now this kind of focus, the long-term commitment and the collaboration will be essential if we're gonna reap the full benefits of Temple Quarter and the other schemes that must come through if we're gonna meet our population's needs now and into the future and importantly, reduce the price the planet pays for us meeting those needs. Now let me share some of the insights, the lessons and insights that we've gained over the years. And there are many important lessons from my time as mayor. Just to share a few to start. First, don't make the perfect the enemy of the good. A well-worn phrase, right? But so often people want to hold out for perfection instead of grappling with the imperfect system we have to operate within. We have to work with the world the way it is rather than the world the way we wish it was. Second, pursuing the status quo does not mean things won't change. Opposing everything doesn't halt economic environmental forces that pull and push this city around. Change is happening around us whether we respond to them, respond to it or not. And a 1970s version of Bristol will not serve us in the 2020s. Third, good things can have bad outcomes for some people. People with single issue campaigns would do well to remember that the solutions they want to see could negatively impact the people they want they must work with to make those changes real. Fourth, responsible power means taking difficult decisions. Many times in this role I found that you have to make a choice between the least worst option. It's not a fun place to be, but I know I can bring the values the city elected to those choices as we see them through. And I'll also just remind us all that power does not exist in an abstract. As an elected politician, power is loaned to me by this city. As a city leader, I'm just one of many sources of power. It was Andy Marsh, the former chief constable, who said, world-class public sector leadership is not about what you control, it's about what you influence. But there's two lessons, insights I wanna share and focus on in particular. The first revolves around our interdependence. See, the fact is Bristol is a collective act. 
Leading a city is a collective act. We do it together. And this reality underpins two of the most important reflections on my time as mayor. First, understanding how to work with our interdependence is key to the delivery we have committed ourselves to. Stephen Covey describes three states of existence. He says, as children, we are dependent. As we grow, we move towards independence. But the highest, most sophisticated status we can hold is to recognise our interdependence. What people get from Bristol is not the result of the actions of, or decisions of any one person or any single organisation. We all, as a city, sit at the intersection of the actions and the inactions, importantly, of all the city shapers and organisations, health, local government, education, private sector, higher education, uh, communities and our unions. That is at the heart of the one city approach we developed and the one city office we grew to bring all of our city's partners together to agree, write and deliver the Bristol One City Plan. My second uh, reflection is on the nature of power. Now our interdependence means there's no such thing as absolute power within the city. I mean, part of the challenge to me is about the power of the mayor, but that does not exist in an abstract. In Bristol, as in cities all over the world, power is based on your ability to convene and influence other powers, rather than command and control what's before you. As a mayor, I, op I operate in a realm of soft power. Now, there's a culture in Bristol where we are concerned about power, and that is healthy. Power has a ripe history of abuse but we must be careful not to decry power altogether. It was Martin Luther King who explained power, properly understood, is the ability to achieve purpose. He pointed out that power without love is weak and anemic. It can't do anything for anyone. And I'll add to this the fact that the city needs external facing power to win investment, to manage its relationships with government, and to resist hostile national and international policies and forces. Power is critical to our city's ability to respond to you, its citizens, to set out its own course and be resilient in the face of the bigger and more complex national and international threats and challenges that are coming our way. Now let me set out some of the challenges uh, which I also think are opportunities facing Bristol. Now in May 2022, Bristol voted to leave the mayoral model and move to a committee system. Now on top of the local elections in May 2024, that means that we will have a fundamentally, fundamental change in the structure of our region's politics. Now any change brings challenges, and I'll share my sense that, as I said, all challenges uh, bring opportunities uh, with them. Now while I believe the decision to move to a committee system wasn't wise, Again, I have to make space for the possibility that if those challenges are, are taken on, that there will be opportunities, if those challenges are properly understood and successfully met. Now first, let me talk specifically about this committee system. Now I think the challenge for the committee system, or I should say actually, for the committee design in the committee system, as is at the moment, um, and the councillors who will eventually sit in it, is to shape something that the city, rather than the councillors, actually need. And there's a subtle but significant difference uh, between those two things. And what is Bristol? Bristol is a core city, a global city with a 15 billion pound economy and a daily workforce of half a million people. We have one of the most vibrant and successful economies in the UK and have experienced sustained growth. We have among the highest productivity levels per capita in the UK and the highest employment and qualification rates of the UK's major cities. As a primary urban area, we have a GVA of £28.2 billion. Bristol's modern economy is built on the creative media, financial services, life sciences, technology, fintech, electronics and aerospace engineering. And in fact, the aerospace industry alone is worth £2.8 billion. 80 people a week migrate to our region. Bristol Airport connects to 115 cities. We have the UK's most centrally located deep sea port, and we're home to the UK's most productive tech cluster. We have two world-class universities, and our city region contributes 40 billion pounds a year to the UK economy. This means we need serious, full-time leadership, engaged 
and working with the whole city. We need leadership that can drive investment and thrive in a competitive world. The specific challenge for the community system is that they must, one, not operate in a local political abstract. It is essential that it looks up and out to the city and the world rather than talking to itself. It's essential that the committee system sees itself as city leaders and enablers, not as council managers choosing between officers' recommendations with a yay, nay or abstain vote. The full measure of leadership is not a vote in a moment of time following an officer briefing. It's an ongoing relationship with all the moving parts of the place. The council cannot just be a collection of services. It must be a leader of place. It must influence and be influenced by every aspect of Bristol life. Secondly, the committee system must offer certainty as soon as possible. It needs to be clear on how it will work and what it will offer to the city and to public and private investors. It must be clear on what it wants to get done. Third, it must offer engagement and participation but not just for the sake of discussion at the expense of delivery. Engagement must be delivery focused. Now with 7,000 adults receiving care from the council costing our taxpayers 200 million pounds and just 800 children receiving care packages that cost 100 million pounds, there is a huge challenge to manage the public purse well. We've launched transformation projects into both adult and children's care to improve cost efficiency, along with another into the growing crisis of temporary accommodation where costs are rising exponentially every year. If future leaders want the ability to impact on the city, they must complete the work to make those services more efficient, or with 75% of our revenue already taken up by care and a further 10% taken up by debt, you will become nothing more than a social service provider and lose the ability to impact on the city through leadership. The committee system in power will have to own the fact that you cannot have everything you want all at once. In fact, the truth is you can't have everything you want even through time. Decisions have to be made. Now for the combined authority. Now with the absence of a Bristol mayor, the West of England combined authority and the Metro Mayor will become the high profile political leadership of this city and the focus of attention and scrutiny. The Metro Mayor will take more power as a determinant of delivery for Bristol and will become the political face and voice of the city on the national and the international stage. Now there are some challenges for WECA, the West of England Combined Authority. First, the voice of the city must remain strong in the combined authority area and should not be diluted. Now this is not to say that the voice of towns and rural areas in our West of England area are less important, but it is to recognise the pivotal and a unique role of the city in driving regional, national and international growth. The combined authority must take forward the scale of ambition for Bristol that the city deserves and the region and the country needs. Secondly, WECA has to become an organisation that delivers big, tangible outcomes for the city region. It must become our voice in Westminster and Whitehall and on the global stage, rather than the passporter of government funds to the region. We need WECA to lead with us and secure government investment in line with the region's agreed priorities rather than operating within the government's limited ambitions. Now take a lead again from Barack Obama, who when asked about entering leadership, said simply, just learn how to get thing, stuff done. Third, the combined authority must be more connected to the public, improving accountability and transparency. As WECA increases in prominence and power in Bristol, it's critical that Bristol voters and councillors have greater oversight and purchase over the decisions that will be made. Now I'm going to conclude with a bit of a personal uh, reflection. Now being Mayor of Bristol has been an incredible um, opportunity. I'm not going to pretend it's been easy. Uh, the challenges are real. 
the aspirations we've had have been beyond the ability of any individual or any organization working alone to deliver. And many of the elements that shape our city are not in our direct control. On top of that, there is a lot of noise. Some of it helpful, some of it not, and some of it very personal, to be frank. And I'll say more about all that when I give my uh, more personal insights in my final major speech as mayor next March. But let me share this story to illustrate what being a mayor, being the mayor of Bristol has meant to me. So just a few years ago, um, I hosted Lisa Nandy in Bristol and we, developed, we visited a development of 13 homes we'd put up in St. Anne's. Now these homes were amazing. It was a former older uh, uh, people's home site that was unused. These homes were efficient. They had solar panels on the roof. They were well insulated. They were social homes. So I knocked on a door unannounced and the father um, opened the door. And as soon as he saw me, he greeted me with a huge smile. So he and his wife had moved with their two daughters, both under the age of three, from a flat in Barton Hill. And when we were there, they wanted us to go in their home and look around. And it was incredible to just experience the pride they had in their home. And importantly, they were able to offer us visitors hospitality, which affirmed their own dignity. And, and when I was involved in the Archbishop of Canterbury's Housing Commission uh, just a few years ago, it was a Bishop of Kensington who did a piece on the theology of housing, interestingly. And one of the things he said is a house, it's, it's the ability to offer hospitality as a key part of having a home that means something. And I saw that there in, in that family. And as I watched them moving around, I just thought to myself that everything in this family's life has just gone in the right direction. The affordability of life, right? in the face of the cost of living, the stability of their family life, their mental health, their children's mental health, the educational prospects of their children. And it was an incredible honor to be there in that moment. And it's at moments like that of real delivery in real lives that all that noise disappears. It just evaporates. And I want to say this job is about making that kind of real change. Now I tell people, quite a lot. It's become one of my uh, little kind of analogies that making change comes in many forms. Sometimes making change is big, visible and revolutionary all in the moment. But more often, making change is actually about nudging the compass just one or two degrees. It's subtle and the change that you've made is barely noticeable at the time. But in 10 years, you're in a wholly different place to the one you would have been if you hadn't nudged that compass. It's a kind of social butterfly effect. That's been what it's been like uh, being the mayor. And I wanna thank you all um, in this hall and beyond for lending me the space and the time uh, to be the mayor and the opportunity to be part of our city's change. Thank you. Stand up. All right. Say that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You want to head back up? Oh, yeah. I'll sit on the end. We've got about 25 minutes for the panel to discuss what Marvin has said and the future of cities. I'd like to introduce my panel members. Um, Imi Kawa from Civic Square in <coughs> Birmingham. Indy Johar, architect from Dark Mountain Labs. Marwa Al Sabuni, who's an architect based in Syria. And myself from Bristol Ideas. Um, for, I was gonna start with you, Indy, but you're coughing badly, so I'm gonna give you some water to begin with. Thank you. And I'm gonna start with, um, oh, you've got some water. I'm gonna start with Imi. Marvin talked about a city of hope mm -hmm. and a city of inclusion. You're involved in lots of initiatives in Birmingham mm -hmm. uh, where you're bringing communities together and you're looking at democratizing 
the place. W what did you think of the speech in terms of that? Um, and tell us a little bit about the work you do, which might help us here. Oh, thank you so much, Andrew, and thank you so much, Bristol. I absolutely love being here. It's such a warm and creative and incredible city. And it was amazing to hear uh, Marvin talking. You know, it was a tough act to follow because uh, that was quite a speech. Um, and I definitely don't envy this role. I have to say that the uh, the amount of contradictions, challenges, opportunities, uh, political knots, um, the windows to make to make transformative change um, and hearing you speak about it in such an eloquent way was um, really, really powerful. I guess um, for me, uh, our work is really centred on um, the deep and transformative power that exists within our populations, in our citizenry, in the people, in their home streets and neighbourhoods. Um, and the scale of the, and I'm sure Indy will talk about this, so I was planning to go after him, but I'm sure he'll give a, a, good, a good picture of this. As Marvin also talked, the scale of the social, ecological, climate crises um, converging on the global north, particularly now, um, but having impacted the global south in significant ways uh, up until now, really shows a scale of transition that is vast. And... It's actually something that whilst it's terrifying, um, it's also a place of great hope and opportunity for how we may transform the way we live, play, eat, grow, travel, and be, be together. And in so many times in history, we have seen transitions happen um, that are led predominantly by that huge groundswell uh, of people in their home streets and neighbourhoods. In COVID, we saw this incredible, if not also devastating interplay between our public services, our communities, the role of mutual aid in our streets, the role of national responses. You start to see this big, entangled, interdependent system at play. But when we've seen previous uh, large-scale transitions, there's one example I, I want to talk about, which um, would have seen almost imaginable, unimaginable at the time. And that is the story of the Tredegar Medical Aid Society in South Wales, a worker cooperative where people, um, working class people in South Wales were organising around their needs around healthcare at a time if, where the question, what if we all had access to health, not just if you, at point of need, not just if you could pay, would have seemed completely unimaginable completely unimaginable. And there were working class people organizing in cooperatives to support themselves to build a model of what would become the future NHS. And we all know that the NHS came after that second world war moment where we needed to rebuild the country and rebuild the economy. And when we built the NHS, we didn't just build a national system. We didn't just build a regional system. We built the neighborhood GPs. And the neighborhood GPs were there to democratize the access to the tools, the resources, the spaces, the courage, the confidence for communities that live in their neighbourhoods to have access to health where they were. And so you went from this question of 60, 70 years before, where it was unimaginable, this huge what if question, to then the people in their home streets and neighbourhoods, not alone, not in an isolationist way, not in a local only way, but the people were at the forefront of rebuilding their communities, their country, their health, um, the economy, and so on and so on. And so for me, this scale of the home street and neighborhood is not just a nice participatory space that you go and talk to when you need to get votes on your side or you need to get people to approve ideas that you've already put into place. It is a fundamental transformative unit. And so that's the work that Civic Square is engaged in, this idea of what if the climate, social and ecological transition, the retrofit of our homes were designed, led, governed and owned by the people who live in their neighbourhoods. And, and why it's so profound to say this and talk about this in Bristol is because Civic Square is part of, I guess, hundreds and hundreds of different um, work across the country, across the world, that is trying to build those future systems today. And Bristol has an incredible example of this with We Can Make Homes. Similar to the story Marvin told, I was lucky a few months ago to walk into the house of Tony and her daughter in Knoll West. Uh, and if you haven't seen the film, you know, please do. Melissa Mean and her team are incredible leaders. 
in this space where you saw the land was owned by Community Land Trust. The land was in the back of um, excess space in uh, Norwest. Uh, Tony and her daughter had been involved in designing it and building it. The materials had come locally and so on and so on. You can watch the film. And so for me, I just want to really say that I think the critical, critical um, thing not to lose in all, of, in all of these huge challenges is that our communities, our homes, our streets, our neighbourhoods, they're not just small, niche, nice to have. You know, the things that you put on the photos, the things that you do a bit of participation and consultation on, they are deep sources of agency, of power, of ancestral wisdom, of dreams, hopes for the future. And I have to say that Bristol, you know, for all the challenges that Marvin would have talked about and, you know, many people will have about what's great here and what's not, to be here in a festival like this, to have such a convivial audience, uh, to have you know, a mayor that stands up and talks in this way and so much of what I've seen over the last uh, few years of being able to work here is a real honour and it's something we would dream of in Birmingham. So you know, for everything that's imperfect, please hold on to what is happening because when you walked in, you were hugging each other and you were high-fiving each other and I, and I think this is gonna be at the heart of how we are going to be able to step up to the scale of transition and, and ambition we're going to need to no doubt face some of probably the hardest times in living memory that are going to come. So, yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Indy. Thank you. <coughs> I've got Indy's cough now. <coughs> Indy, you, you've written about the, the big changes that need to be made, the, the challenges to come. When you watch a film like you saw tonight about Bristol in 2033 and you hear what's been proposed what what's your reaction to that in terms of meeting those challenges um actually i'd like to build on what ibi said in a in a world where we're often in rhetorical politics right a language of often division how incredible is it to be here just for a moment just take it in it's incredible that we're here and we could be all here in some degree of kindness to hear about this. And I think we often forget that, right? So I want to acknowledge deeply that. <laughs> and, and when we look forward, you know, Martin was right. We've had COVID, we've had a food, food price inflation crisis, 40% increase in foods, energy crisis, Unfortunately, that's not going to stop. And I say that not with any glee, but with a recognition of the scale of issues that we're going to face. Some economists are going to sit here and tell you inflation is going to come down. I think it's very unlikely when we start to see more global shocks. Now, why I say that is that's just one thing. Everyone talks about building homes. I get it. An average home in the UK is, it takes 800 kilograms of carbon per meter squared, embodied carbon. The best home gets to 150 kilograms per meter squared of embodied carbon. We have to get to 6.3 kilograms. 6.3. Now why I relate, rate those numbers out is currently, if we use our carbon budget, we've all signed up to the Paris Accord, all of UK can afford to build, within its carbon budget of homes, can afford to build 14,000 homes. Now, I, don't say, I just say that not to scare us. I say that, that these are the challenges that we're facing of the order of magnitude. In order to do that, we're going to have to build a bioregional economy, a material economy. In order to do that, we're going to have to transform our food systems of an order of magnitude and decarbonize them. That's, and this is not going to, this is not, a, I'm not saying this as a politician. I'm telling you, this is likely. How many people here are vegan? Look, I would like all of you to look up the impact of your food systems and what you eat. And I'm not saying this from a moral perspective. I'm saying this, if you are genuinely smart, kind people, look up the numbers. Look up the implication in terms of carbon. Look up the implication in terms of soil erosion. And I say all this because that is the scale of order of magnitude we're changing. My shirt, it's about a 40, 45 pound shirt maybe, 
If we were to true cost that shirt in terms of social and environmental costs, it's between 250 to 450 pounds. Why I'm saying that is our material economy will change as we internalize those costs. So we are about to go into a massive transformation. It won't be a little bit faster than 2004. We'll get a little bit better than 2004. We're going to electrify our city. We don't have enough copper available in the short-term mining capacity globally. People talk about timber homes. Well, actually, the timber supply is constrained. I'm not saying that to scare us. I'm saying that in order to change, we're going to have to build a new bioregional economy, biomaterial economy. We're going to have to build a new financial capabilities of cities and places. We're going to have to build bioregional investment banks and bioregional development banks across the UK to be able to make those transitions. And we're going to have to do that in a worldview, as work that we're doing with IMI says that three degrees is where our current policy landscape is taking us. Three degrees average temperature rise. Three degrees means five degrees on land. Five degrees on land means eight degrees plus in cities. And I'm saying that because I don't think we quite realize the, sc the scale of it. Now, m my final point here on this is, we've, I really, f I really am thankful to politicians because actually they hold a very difficult space. Yet somehow, as societies, we're not able to have honest conversations with each other. And politicians are trapped in Overton windows which are non-real. They are not real. How do we as society have the conversations that are required? Even if the truth hurts, actually we can do extraordinary moves and make the transition that's necessary. But the lies and the delusions between ourselves will kill us. Literally kill us. There will be a short term I'll feel good today, I'll feel good a little less good tomorrow, feel a little less good tomorrow. It's like a frog being boiled. So I deeply respect the space that's been created here. I deeply respect that, because I think that we're going to need these spaces to have a quality of conversation, to have a quality of realization that the scale of this transformation. And in this transformation, I think this is going to be a new conversation. How do we unfold the whole capacity of every human being? You are not labor, as in not a political party, as in you are not units of labor. You're not a freedom of choice of what you consume. You're a freedom to be human. That is the invitation, the radical freedom to be human. I know many of us feel entrapped in our lives right now. That is an offer that we have to make a new unleasing of human capacity in a radical format. So in this transition, yes, there will be difficulties, but there are also great invitations to be radically human. And I think this is a testament to all of you, literally all of you, to be able to be in this room, have, have these sort of conversations, because I think that's what we're going to need to move all of us together in a way that's radically needed. Thank you. Thank you. And our, our third response is Marwa al Sabuni. Marwa is an architect still in Syria. <coughs> um, Marwa, you've been through a lot in Syria. What, what lessons do you draw from the, the governance of a place, your city of Homs, both before the war and, and now, and the lessons that might have for, for us here? Well, thank you, Andrew. Uh, obviously, I'm an outsider to the conversation. Uh, <coughs> but because I'm an outsider, maybe I could see from a distance uh, what kind of path the city is taking. And I would like to share an analogy with my own city. So I, my city is called Homs, uh, and it's the third largest city in Syria. Perhaps you heard the news a decade ago when it, it erupted in violence. But before the war, we had, uh, we had a, a government, a governor's uh, issue in, in, in how to manage the city, how to build the city. And actually, uh, we had a, a governor who had a dream for the city, and he called it Homs's dream. And uh, the Homsies called that dream Homs's nightmare because basically that governor wanted, to, wanted the city to, to turn into a Gulf model, uh, a US city model, uh, any you know, global city model that you will kind of sacrifice the, the, the character of the city in order to create 
growth and create high rises and, and house people, of course. But uh, in the way the sacrifices that were made, were made were to demolish uh, big parts of the old city and also to allure sometimes to, you know, uh, invite people to invest in, in building that dream. And uh, by only by uh, changing one, one law, which was the investment law, he, he basically introduced higher investment uh, percentages. So people were voluntarily just sacrificing their old houses in order to build high rises. And in the way, there, there were, the, the social fabric in the city was destroyed and the urban fabric also, the whole character of the city was destroyed and the bubble soon erupted in, in demonstrations that you haven't heard of. I mean, the demonstrations in, in Homs were against the change that was taking place. It was so rapid, so radical, and it sacrificed, um, like I said, the, 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 uh, the social fabric of the city. And that led to, in, in a way, to, for Homs to erupt in violence. I mean, there were a number of reasons, political and economic, but they were also, uh, it made the city very vulnerable to, to inner conflict. So I guess what I want to, to say is that uh, I don't envy any, anybody in, in, in office because it's a, it's a great responsibility and how they find the balance is, is, is a huge responsibility. But I guess as, uh, as an architect, uh, I, I would say that the, the worst type of trade and the most dangerous type of trade is the, uh, the trade of dreams. And we tend to, to engage in this trade uh, too often now in the name of, of, of creating, you know, more, more homes and, and, and more growth and all of that. Uh, but there is a real distinction here between a house and an apartment and a home, because a home embody those relationships and those, those uh, uh, fabrics that we need to, to guard and guarantee and to find the balance between that and between finding you know, some kind of economic cycle that would work for everybody. Thank you, Marwa. Um, Marvin, Marvin, I want to just give you the final opportunity to come back on some of those points. What's your reflections on what you've heard tonight? So on, um, I think the point on communities and the beginning of the NHS, I say one of our reflections as a city during COVID was that for all the structures we set up, not just national structures, but um, but within this, not, and again, not just government structures, but to, to, to support people with hunger and exclusion and mental health during, during the lockdown. It was actually community togetherness that was the, the, the key source of resilience. A neighbor knocking on a neighbor's door because they know that neighbor. That, that's what you call, you know, services can't identify all vulnerable people. So community, how we build community and human relationships and character is, is absolutely essential. It's not something you can it's not something you can kind of strategize for, but you can think how do you create conditions in which better relationships are more likely than bad relationships. I'll just give you an, just a small example, by the way. Um, over a year and a half ago, when we were first going into cost of living crisis, uh, we were seeing it on the horizon beginning of 2022. Uh, we said, okay, cost of living crisis is coming, but at least people are turning their heating off. What happens in the autumn when they have to put the heating on and the bills are going up? So we said, well, let's set, let's, can we work with communities to set up warm places, right? So faith groups, community venues, just people, pe basic people go to be warm, but they're gonna be more than that, food, uh, financial advice and so forth. So we aimed, we aimed to set up 24. We ended up with 106 in Bristol. And, that's, and, and when we had our thank you event earlier this year, we had about 100 people there who'd run these places. And the point I made was, if we'd give someone a b budget of half a million pound and six months, they could not have set up 106 welcoming places. Those only got set up because we didn't impose. We said, here's a model, this is an intervention we need, who's up for it? And communities just started coming forward. And we also said, by the way, at the front end, we haven't got lots of money. So it wasn't a funding-led model. We have to be very careful with that. We can't abdicate public responsibility and uh, leverage it onto faith groups and community groups and say, you've got to make up with a thousand pound budget for a hundred thousand pound cut. But nonetheless, there isn't any money, so we need that mobilization, um, uh, you know, it's critical. I think the, the spaces for people to talk is one that 
one that we long, we long for, right? To be perfectly frank as a mayor. I think one of my, one of my biggest frustrations is just, I, I said this around Colston, right? Binary, simplistic solutions. We, it, it's imposed everywhere. And, and there's too much gotcha stuff going on. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, we filter the public discussion through Twitter and whatever it is, I don't know how many characters it is now, that just says, you are like this. Or an interpretation of event in which someone says, well, this happened and therefore I know what your motivations were. You can't know what motivations are from the event. Parents weren't allowed out of their children. You know, you sent me to bed early, therefore you don't love me. No, <laughs> there, there's stuff behind event, events, right? Now, we may be mistaken in the way we respond to it, but that's not an indication of the motivation. So creating these spaces in which we can, uh, we can um, understand the world and, and face up to the full ferocity of the challenges that are in front of us and the wicked, limited, contradictory options that lie before us are, are absolutely crucial. And, and that goes to the heart of me. I mean, I'm a mixed race guy, grew up, you know, white mum, black father, in racially fractured, hostile, I would say, 1970s and 80s uh, Britain. I, I long for reconciliation and people come together across those boundaries. On, on the point about um, your yeah, housing again, and that, that throws up, like I saw I put housing up the front as the wicked, it captures so many of the contradictions. We do need to build quality homes in communities, but we also, in some sense, we're robbed of the time to think about that because people are in temporary accommodation right here, right now. Not only paying the price every, time, every night they're in a B&B with their children, but actually costing the city loads of money because temporary accommodation is one of the biggest financial threats to Bristol City Council uh, right now. So we have to build. Then I had, uh, I'll give you an example, I had the full council not too long ago. Well, actually it was a long ago, it was a year ago. Uh, there were three public statements in this full council, right? Everyone's angry at the council, right? So three public statements. They all sat next to each other. The first public statement, stood up and said, do not build on greenfield, you know, do not build on greenfield land. And the other two, and made a, you know, blah, blah, blah. the other two people clapped them. The second statement said, solve the housing crisis. You've got to solve the housing crisis. The other two clapped. The third person said, do not build too dense and high. And the other two clapped. I said, you've got to talk to each other. <laughs> Don't just, don't just direct it at the city council because actually your three positions cannot sit together. This is the point I made. You cannot have everything you want at every moment in time. There are trade-offs to be had and, and good solutions have a price to be paid and good outcomes can have negative consequences for some people. It's just the wicked, contradictory world in which we have to come to terms that we live in. Well, we're out of time. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all for coming. This is our, we, we've run the State of the City speech right from the start. It's our final State of the City speech and discussion. And we're very grateful to all of you who have participated in this over the years. I don't know if there's anybody in the room who's been to every one of them. Um, if you do, you get you have a, a hand up, Andrew, is there anyone? Is there anybody? I've been to them all, I tell you. Oh. So oh, there's a few of you. So. My, mum, my mum and wife have. Yeah, so <laughs> we'll, um, all of them right back to the previous mayor as well, Marvin. So, oh, well, not those. Not those, so, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, um, so, so we'll award a long service medal to those who did, metaphorically. Um, so thank you very much for that. And thank you to all the people who've supported this event. We're very grateful to the University of Bristol um, and the vice chancellors we've worked with. Um, we're very grateful to um, the partners of Bristol Ideas for supporting this event, and we're very grateful, and I'm very grateful to my team for putting on this event as well each year. It is, I hope, one of the spaces, the many spaces, that Bristol Ideas through Festival of Ideas and Festival of the Future City and Festival of Economics and all the other work we've done that has helped provide that space for discussion and learning and debate. So thank you to everyone involved. Most of all tonight, thank you to our panel, to Imi, to Indy, to Marwa and to Marvin. Thank you very much. And this is part of our Festival of the Future City. There are more events tomorrow. Do come down and see some of the events. You're very welcome and to continue the discussion. So thank you very much and good night. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>